Hello, this is Cuckoo. Um, in this episode of this series that I'm making where I'm preparing for an electronic gig, uh, I'm going to show you where I'm currently at in my uh, gig that I'm preparing for right now. And I'm using the DigiTact as my main, uh, main device and uh, I'm having a bit of stuff around it. Uh, what I say is that currently I feel like I'm in the middle of the process, right in the middle. I'm not in the beginning, I'm not anywhere close to the end, in the middle. And uh, this is one of the tipping points, I'd say. When you're in the middle, everything feels unfinished, rightfully so, because it, it is unfinished. And you also feel like you're missing some of the stuff that you said no to, or perhaps I say I do that because uh, I said no to a lot of stuff that I really like to use. But in this gig, I need to make it a bit more compact and travel friendly. So I made a few uh, decisions of how to make it more travel friendly, uh, and and also a lot of the music is just like a little pattern here and there. It's like nothing is finished at all, and in any creative process. When you're in the middle, it feels very, very uh, much like a disaster, I'd say. Uh, but it's so important at this point that you need to believe in yourself. I need to believe in myself and my ideas. And I need to tell myself that it's going to be fine. I'm going to follow through with the ideas. And as I'm getting closer to the end, I will see the results of all the hard work. But right now, it feels like it's so scattered and everything is just ideas and little patterns here and there. How do I transition between the patterns? And it's a disaster. So I want to show you where I'm at right now to give you a feel for how the pr creative process works for me. And yeah. So just the first advice here is believe in yourself. If you feel like everything is a disaster, chances are that you're in the middle of the creative process. Uh, so stick to the idea and, and get closer to the end and you start to see the, the fruit. <laughs> okay, so let's have a look at my, my rig that I've uh, decided to use and take it from there. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Okay, so here we are. This is the setup that I plan to use, more or less. Uh, let's go through the stuff here. Uh, the dig attack will be like the main brain that most of the songs and the arrangements will be here. Uh, there are eight tracks of samples and eight tracks of MIDI. I'm going to use one MIDI channel, sometimes two, to sequence this little guy here. This is a sampler instrument called Beat Squeezer. Uh, unfortunately, it's a limited quantity side project of the creator who made this, uh, but I always show it to people because I think it's brilliant. And he's manufacturing more of them uh, sometimes, uh, and like a little run of 20 units, and then maybe later that year, another 20 units. So keeping out uh, on Beat Squeezer, very, very interesting. Uh, what it is, is uh, a sampler instrument. I've uh, put a lot of sampled instruments in there, sampled like pianos that I like. This is like a clavicet. Uh, this is... A piano. And uh, this is another piano that I sampled from my neighbor. <laughs> So I've prepared a lot of instruments uh, that I don't want to bring physically. I can't bring a piano, I can't bring all of the synths in the world, so I'm sampling them every note and then I'm placing them back into the sample format, putting them here. It's a very neat way of bringing a specific sound that you want uh, on the go. So as you can see now, I can play this with a dig attack and with a keyboard. Uh, 
one thing is that I want to sequence this and I want to also be able to play over it at the same time and I also want to be able to record on the fly uh, into the sequencer. I'm not going to do that much but pe perhaps like one or two songs I'll do something like that. Uh, and the way I set it up is the MIDI is coming out from this it's going into the MIDI input uh, and then the MIDI out which is where all the sequencing is coming out is going straight to this but then we've got this problem that so how, how could I play it at the same time as I'm sequencing it I could do it by using the auto channel here then I can play the the sound that's selected with a keyboard but the downside of that is that I also have on the floor I got a little uh, uh, sustain pedal and this sustain pedal is not coming through when you're playing like that with the auto channel and the uh, dig tact and the MIDI out uh, it's not capturing the sustain pedal because in the electron world sustain pedals is not a, a thing <laughs> so what I'm doing is I'm also sending MIDI through and MIDI through is the unfiltered MIDI signal coming from the keyboard here uh, it's coming straight through and out so instead of sending it directly here I'm sending it through this MIDI solution quadra merge what this is doing it's merging several MIDI signals into one so the sequencing and the live um, playing is going into here and going out to the beat squeezer long explanation sorry about that but it, this way I can play at the same time I can sequence stuff here on the sequence so you can also hear like there's a reverb the reverb is coming from this Strymon Blue Sky I'm using this uh, I'm, I know there are more advanced reverbs there like Big Sky from Strymon beautiful beautiful box of reverb but I'm particularly selecting the Blue Sky because it's small, compact and worry free I'd say I, I never worry about this because there's nothing that can go wrong basically uh, it's three modes uh, it's plate, room and spring in this case I'm using the room plate, plate is very good too spring is more, you know, this spring like spring reverb, yeah. Um, and the normal, then the modified, which is sort of modifying the, the pitch in the tail of the reverb to make it sort of chorus, I guess. Shimmer is making an octave, which could be used for a specific effect. effect. Yeah, and it's on high damp, pre delay, and low damp. It's worry free and it sounds beautiful. I use it all the time. And the specific thing with the room, the way the room uh, algorithm is created, is that you can. Uh, you can hear that, right? I, It's just the way that that particular kind of reverb works. It takes the whole uh, reverb uh, freeze buffer, I don't know what terms, uh, and slows it down or speeds it up and stuff. Yeah. And that could be used as well in an interesting way. The plate reverb does not have that effect. So this is more safe to use and it sounds great too, but I, I don't know, I particularly like the room. Yeah, so how is the reverb coming into this box then? Well, we've got this little fellow here. This is the K-Mix from Keith McMillan. Uh, it's a very compact 
a feature rich mixer for its size. Eight inputs and eight outputs. The reason why I'm bringing this is because uh, when you're performing like an electronic gig, chances are very high that you'll come to a venue where they don't have a dedicated sound engineer and you need to rig something quite fast perhaps maybe they're not, not like a, a long rigging time and to have your own mixer is uh, making it easier for you to to rig and uh, yeah it's just eliminating uh, unknown factors so I'm bringing this mixer because it's very very compact and it's got numerous outputs which I think is interesting so what I'm doing here now I'm sending some of that sound let's see here you can see it. The, the keyboard is here and the effects return is here so what I've done here is like there is several sub mixes main mix Aux 1 mix, which is here, Aux 2, Aux 3, and so forth. I'm using the Aux 1 uh, as an uh, effects end. So if I press this, I can see what the mix looks like there. And uh, you can see that, oh, there's actually a lot of this going on. So now, You can see that these are coupled as a stereo pair, which is very, very neat as well to, to be able to couple them as stereo pairs or treat them as two separate mono tracks. So it's coming out here, it's going into here, and then it's coming back here. And uh, sadly, it's actually a stereo uh, effect and it sounds beautiful in stereo, but I'm running out of ports, so I'm, I'm using it as a mono mono um, reverb. Yeah, you can see that there is also some, a tad of level coming out here. This is the microphone, vocal. I'm using this microphone at the moment. This is the Sennheiser E935. Um, someone uh, recommended me to use this mic years ago, so I bought it and yeah, I think it's good. Um, there are several great microphones out there. I'm just using this because it's what I have. Um, so yeah, um, let's see, go to the main mix again. You can see, I'm not sure if you can see it actually, but this is kind of dimmed, which means it's muted. Shift and the lower part will unmute it. It's not dim anymore. You, also, you can also see this turning green. So now it's muted, now it's unmuted. Hello, hello. Yeah, so this is my microphone. Another thing with having uh, a mixer with you is that you might have access to some features on the mixer that is not there if you don't have a mixer such as EQ and compressor noise gate and uh, yeah basically that panning I'm not sure if it makes any sense to do panning stuff live uh, but actually it does I'll get back to that this microphone is now going through um, a compressor so I'm compressing it not enormously but just a little bit a tad of compression compression and also it's going through a noise gate I believe hey yeah Doosh. yeah some like uh, el eliminating some little noise there noise floor and also this is something I could adjust when I get to to the venue to see how much noise is there? Does it make sense to even use the noise gate and stuff? Uh, but to set up the compressor beforehand um, could be a good idea. But make sure that you know what you how the compressor works. But because when you get to a stage in the venue, uh, there will be much much sounds around you, and perhaps you've got monitoring. And uh, if you make too much uh, makeup gain you can have a, a lot of uh, uh, feedback and uh, that is not good in the live situation so make sure you know how the compressor works if you want to use it I think 
it's nice to have the compressor there to kind of round off the uh, the dynamics of the microphone a little bit but don't be too heavy on the makeup game because it's uh, yeah there's a high risk of making making some feedback uh, and I'm also using a tad of EQ I think I could bypass the EQ and like that now it's not using the EQ anymore and in a way I think the 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 one without the EQ sounds a, nice on its own but as soon as you mix it with with the music I mean I'm not going to sing a lot here but I might sing a little bit in a few of the songs so when I'm turning on the uh, EQ again I've I'm rounding off some of the low frequencies and also some mids there. I'm trying to find a specific mid-tone that is a bit disturbing. Uh, and yeah, it looks like I'm actually raising some of the highs here, which is um, which I might have to roll back. And not like this, but having a lot of highs in there like this uh, is very dangerous if you're on stage because this will for sure be picked up uh, in a feedback loop and create some really hissy nasty feedback tones uh, if you're on a big uh, sound system so I've just lifted it a, a tad there and also I can select what frequency I want to use yeah. so this is good to have on board mm. Actually, I'm going to turn off the mic now and use the other mic, uh, the video microphone that's picking up everything. Uh, this as well. I mentioned that the, the piano is actually sending some reverb to this box. Yeah, it's also going through the compressor. So let's pick the piano, Where, which one is it? This one. Uh, the compressor is also used on the piano because I feel... Um, when I was running the, the piano uncompressed and clear, it stands out a little bit too much. It sounds very uh, sampled and very MIDI, like a MIDI piano. I mean, it is a very basic piano I, I, it's not a stage piano or anything it's very a simple way of bringing a piano sound like this but when i turn off the compressor and then when i turn it on again basically what it's doing it's um, handling the dynamic and rounding it off a bit and making it wick, 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 making it stay within some uh, uh, I don't know boundaries and so perhaps it's not kicking in that much when I'm playing one tone but as soon as I as soon as it gets th thicker and thicker in the sound it's kicking in a bit and kind of uh, handling the dy dynamics a bit. I was actually using, I was planning to use a, an all analog mixer because I trust analog mixers more than a, a digital mixer like this. I was actually planning to use this. This is a Rolls Minimix Pro. It's a very bare bones uh, stereo mixer very high quality when I connect stuff into this I felt very secure and there's something about the analog mixes I don't know if it's a placebo or anything but I could feel the headroom of an analog mixer feels uh, like you can't distort the signals with, with this I always feel like I'm I have to be really careful not to distort the signals. So as you can see on the levels here, I keep them in the middle. And if we turn off this visualizer, <laughs> I, I'm keeping the levels down, uh, but this has a very weak output signal. So it might introduce some noise, I'm not sure. Whereas this totally analog mixer 
is uh, much more robust in a way. <laughs> I don't know. But in the end, what tipped me over to, to use this again was that because I didn't have a compressor for the piano sounds, I felt like it stood out too much. I didn't have any compressor for the vocals and no EQ for the vocals. So then it could only be used as a, like a talk microphone. And I, I didn't have any effect sense. And all of these things made me think like, yeah, you know, I should probably use this. I, I have this. I've used it over for over two years now, I think. And uh, yeah, yeah, it does the job. The reason why I was going to ditch it was because uh, of the distortion sensitivity. And I think in a strange way, I could really feel the, the lower latency of an analog uh, mixer. Um, I'm not sure if it's placebo or anything, but when I play, especially keyboards, when I play keyboards on an analog mixer, um, I, f I feel more secure, I feel better and my fingers respond to the sound that I hear. Yeah, I'm not sure what the throughput um, latency is here actually, it's very good. I don't f feel insecure when I'm using this digital mixer, but it's when I when I tried this I was like, oh, this is actually this is actually really nice to play on, yeah. But necessities and features they uh, kind of was winning, mm, yeah. Where is my notebook, by the way? Let's find my notebook. Here it is. Um, there we go. Okay. We we'll call it stage mixer, right? For me, it needs to be compact. Both of these that I, I was showing now as compact mixers, stereo mixers, because I'm using synthesizers with and stereo reverbs and stereo. It's not that I totally need the stereo sound, but but because they output stereo, the stereo sound is usually a bit richer than the mono signal. Even though this is handling samples mono, you can pan them, which I'm not doing that much of, but the stereo in there is, is um, the, the reverb in there is in stereo, and the delay is also in stereo. I think it's richer when you use the stereo sound. And I also appreciate the uh, effect sound and I appreciate to have a compressor in there. The, the compressor might not be that much, you know, a deal breaker, but if you're going to handle a microphone, then I'd say it's very important to have some sort of compressor and EQ in there. Actually, not only for vocals, you know what I've done? You know, um, now listen to this sound. This is what it sounds like now. But what I've actually done here is, I go to the EQ, I've actually applied some EQ on this. Let's turn off the EQ. Perhaps you can't hear it right now, it's so subtle. I actually, I actually turn it off, <laughs> I'm not sure. But what I, what I realized that when I design a sound, like when I designed this piano patch, I'm designing it only hearing the piano. But when I, need, when I want to bring that piano into a mix, like if I want to bring the piano into this sound, Most of the time, I've all, already, um, you know, populated a lot of the the spectrum, so there's a lot of overlapping uh, 
frequencies that most of the time I'd say it's in the bass frequencies so when I'm creating a, a patch on its own it might be a tad too warm to fit in a mix so I like to have the EQ here because then I could kind of not make it thin like this but just to illustrate the point here but just roll it off a tad the bass if this already has like a very rich and warm bass there. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so the EQ, I'm actually using the EQ on the piano sound as well, just to, to try to balance it. And I haven't gotten to that point yet, but uh, I'm planning to to create more songs and make them uh, ready to, to perform. And one thing that I, that I find, I mean, it's natural, when you're performing live, you want to hear your instrument a little bit louder than what the, audio, what the audience does. So when I'm performing, I'd like to hear the piano a little bit louder just to make sure that I can relate to the tones that I play. Uh, it makes it easy for me. To, to hear what I'm doing. Also with the vocals, um, I want to hear the vocals a bit louder in my ears. If there is a sound engineer, he can take it, you know, uh, control of that and they can provide me with the monitoring that I need. But if there is no sound engineer, you need to practice to perform with a level uh, that is a bit lower than what you'd want. <laughs> So, um, or you need to find a way to make perhaps another sub uh, mix where you can create your own monitoring solution. So I've got like the AUX2 could be my monitoring or the AUX3 perhaps. And I could use these outputs to create like a monitoring signal. So when you're practicing like, like this, I'm not sure I'm going to use this piano for this song, but... <laughs> Now, in this case, I could hear myself clearly, but for you, maybe you were thinking, you know, that piano is a bit too loud, and that's probably the case. So record yourself, record yourself, and see what it sounds like when you play back. And most of the time, I, I get a bit, um, a bit um, surprised that, oh, that, that was very loud, very loud. I should probably bring it down in the mix. And, and then it gets a bit more difficult to play, but yeah. One thing with electronic music is that uh, in, in many of the genres of electronic music, you're going to perform uh, on venues where DJs perform. And those venues, they don't typically have like a sound engineering, uh, handling monitoring for you and mixing and stuff. No, they, they usually have like perhaps a mixer or or just a DJ deck and then you just go up there and rig yourself in and uh, and perform you're kind of on your own there um, so it's very good to to keep that in mind when you're uh, preparing like this is might be essential to have like a, a good mixing uh, preparation going before you go there yeah so what else yeah oh we've got this little fella here this is called the uh, OPZ it's coming out very very soon from Teenage Engineering it's their latest and greatest <laughs> machine um, as you can see it's tiny it's tiny but I think it's gonna be huge uh, hu hugely popular I think when people realize that oh it's actually not just a pocket operator. No, it's a, a big performance machine. I think a lot of people will have uh, to think about it again if they disregard it as a toy. So what I'm gonna do with the, with the OPZ is I'm gonna use a standalone, no synchronization, and I will use probably two songs 
uh, perform two songs and maybe an improvised uh, song. So right now I'm not sure what songs are in there. go too much in depth here with the OVZ. I'm going to make a tutorial for that uh, later, uh, later this fall. And But I can say this, it, it's much more, um, I mean, much more feature rich than what you'd expect. <laughs> I think this, um, in many ways, I could just ditch this and only use this. Uh, it would require me to to uh, make a lot of preparations and but style wise the synth engines here might not always uh, rival what I can achieve with the longer samples and stuff but it's you know <laughs> So basically, I, I, I press a little P button here. I got ten uh, projects uh, with different songs in each project. Every song can have sixteen patterns, and they can be chained. And uh, yeah, so project one. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Um, low. Yeah. This is really cool, and it's also so lightweight. So uh, when I'm performing on this, I will probably pick it up. And depending on what I'm doing, I'm gonna, you know, hold it a bit different. And this is the, the point where you want to make some extra connection with the, the audience, at least for me. Just pick it up and move away from your gear a bit and, and engage with your audience. And... Uh, I don't know, it depends on the stage, perhaps you can sit on the on the edge of the stage and just uh, chill out with the audience, it's gonna be great. <laughs> that is a good point, I think I'm gonna make a little note, a note, a little note here, a note, uh, engage with the audience, yeah, how about that? Engage with, is that how you say it, engage with the audience, engage, I don't know. Um, as an electronic musician, you keep track of a lot of stuff in front of you. You keep track of so many uh, devices and stuff. So you're running the risk of just being someone that's looking down on your gear and never looking up on the audience. I think that you should look at the audience. Uh, maybe not all the time, of course, there's a lot of stuff going on and you need to keep track of. but. Uh, engage with the audience, look at them, perhaps say a few words if it's fitting, if it's not fitting, don't say anything, but make at least some connection with the crowd. Perhaps there is, uh, I'd say, uh, even go as far as saying, leave some space in the arrangements where you know that you don't need to fiddle with stuff and let it run for a while, while you check on the audience, check how they're doing, see if they're enjoying it, and maybe uh, just show them that you're happy for, for them being there and you share this moment of your music together. 
And if you do that once in a while, I think you you connect to them and you create this uh, communication between you. It's not just a record that's playing. It's not just uh, an MP3 or uh, some streaming service. No, there's music happening right here, and you're the boss, and uh, you're taking the 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 audience into account when you perform because you're doing it together. If you do the same performance in an empty room, perhaps you'd make some different changes in, in, in the music. And if there was a venue where everyone was sitting in a sofa, perhaps you'd bring it down a bit and be cosy. And if there is a, a venue where people are standing up, perhaps you're, uh, you know... Uh, Bring, bringing the tempo up a bit, maybe the energy level uh, up a bit. Yeah, I'd say keep the arrangements a bit open like that so you can at least make some adjustments to the energy level. So engage with the audience, uh, check on them from time to time, see how they're doing. Arrangements somewhat open. I mean, with electronic music, you basically just you're so stationary, <laughs> you're just on this one place. A guitar player, they move around on stage, they're making these fancy moves and it looks cool because they express their music through the whole body. Uh, uh, like an uh, electronic sequencing person, uh, it's very stationary, so it's difficult to do that. Uh, but try to do it anyway, you know. Uh, yeah, do something. Just show people that you're actually enjoying this and and you're doing it right now. I want to go through what I've got so far, and I'm gonna mention uh, a little bit on how I plan to perform, and also what's totally missing. So, I, I've done it like this. If you're familiar with Electron, uh, they've got something called banks and patterns. Banks, they got eight banks, and each bank contains 16 patterns. I was thinking every bank can, can contain two songs, sometimes maybe even three, but for the most part, two songs. And in the patterns, I'm thinking one row could be one song. The next row is another song. So I'm going to make a structure like that so that I know uh, that this is the way it works. And I'm planning to use the last pattern uh, of every row to be a transition pattern. So when I know that I'm kind of nearing the end, I know that when I go to the last pattern, this might even have some of the next song baked into it in a way, or it's preparing the mood or a, a, a BPM change or something to close in on the next song. Because of what I want to do here is to change my music a little bit from what I usually do. I, I've been used to doing songs uh, in, in sort of a pop format. One song, and then a little break, and then the next song. I want to try to change my uh, rules a bit and, and bring my melodic kind of electronic music into a, almost electronica, where it, it kind of moves and flows a, a little bit, and then transitions into the next song. I want to try that and see how it goes. So what I'm going to do now is go through the patterns what I have so far and lay out a strategy for how to complete it. Cool. Back A, pattern one. Um, yeah, listen to this. And as you can see on the row here, I've got two patterns. Let's check out the second one. Yeah, these are connected. So could go from here. And with most of the patterns here, I'm planning to, to make something called a fill. So when I, whenever I press this, 
I get an intensity, uh, increase the intensity. Usually, it's perhaps a bit simple, but usually it's more hi hats <laughs> and some extra snares. So listen to this. Let's see if there is some fill here. So that will be a, a tool for me to make uh, like a more lively, live-like uh, arrangement. Uh, also, I, I will, most of the time I'll be in this green mode here. The green mode is mute mode. I can mute stuff, mute the different channels. Uh, there is also purple mode, uh, which is also mute mode. But with a purple mode, you're, you're muting uh, tracks uh, per pattern. So if I mute something here now, I go to another pattern, they will be unmuted here, go back to that pattern, they'll be remembered, the mute state is remembered. Uh, but I want to use the, the global mute, because then I'll, I'll quickly forget what, what I just muted and what I didn't mute. So if, if I'm in the global, um, global uh, mode, I can keep track of it in a more live matter. I don't know. Yeah, I, I feel more confident of doing this in the green mode. And there's also a way to latch that fill. So right now, It just fills whenever you press it. But if I press the fill and then yes, and then release the uh, fill before I release yes, it's like a gesture for me. I've done it so many times now, so I, I've been used to it. Then it sticks, it's latched. <laughs> Yeah, so that is one pattern there. Uh, the next song. Same thing there. I have some extra snares and extra rhythm, like an intensity boost on the fill button. I, this brings a smile to my face. Uh, I, I really like this tune, this energy, this positive kind of melodic stuff there. So this is something I want to work on. Okay, next, bank, pattern one. I made some different variations here just to see where this is going. I'm not sure I'm gonna keep this. When I play it, every time I reach this song, I'm like, I don't know, it needs a lot of work. So we'll see, probably remove it. So the next one. This is the way I usually start out when I make songs on, on uh, devices like the Dig Attack. I create like a little nice loop and then trying to refine it and make this make it sound crispy and nice and and sort of open uh, because I want there to be room for a melody in there. Yeah. This is very much in the early stages. I don't know where it's gonna go. Uh, so yeah, next bank, new song. In a song like that, 
I could do that live. And another thing I want to do with the with the songs on the dig attack is to mold them into craziness. Like this, you can make a copy of this pattern and start messing around with it. And if you reach the state where you think, wow, that's actually cool, what I just did there, let's paste it. You can copy that state, return to the pattern, and perhaps go to this other pattern and paste it there. So now I've got a little copy of my sketch there, which might or might not become something. So let's see what I've prepared here. Yeah, this is a place where I've actually put two songs in one row here. So first this one, and then this one here. Yeah, I'm not sure how I'm gonna proceed with that. Next one here. And this could be a place where I, I'm happy that I have a mixer that I can send to the effect box. Now I could suddenly put reverb on this as well, the same kind of reverb, which could be fun. Let's try it. So I could use the mixer uh, as a performance tool as well. I mean, there's a very good reverb in the machine as well, but this, uh, it's another option to to create like a, an atmospheric place like that and to have control of that outside of the box. This is very nice. And because of these, now going into the same reverb, 
it's also part of the same space, which is nice. Yeah. Yeah, perhaps I should make a note of that. I mean, this refers to the openness, I think. Openness. What is openness? Open. Is that even a word? Openness. So right there, I, I just made a, a decision like this, feeling like, you know, I should bring it down to this kind of low, chill, chill place. Going from this. So this kind of openness is something that I really like. And this also is connected to engage with the audience, to have some uh, parameters in the music which you can control and mold uh, in order to communicate with the, the audience in front of you. So openness, energy level. And I think reverb is a, a very powerful tool um, to go to to come to a completely different space uh, so reverb I mean it, it would be really cool to have a like the the big sky instead of the blue sky because the big sky is experimental you could be really experimental with that one and create a very customized space uh, customized space yeah okay anyhow things let's see yeah, this is another place where I've put two songs sketches in one row. So this sounds like this. How about next? This is totally different. So I'm not sure what to make of this. I just know that I like it. <laughs> so next bang song. Most electronic genres, they operate in the same kind of uh, BPM throughout the whole gig or slowly raising it and, uh, uh, and that's cool and all but I want to I take it completely down sometimes and then uh, go to a completely different uh, upbeat mode. So with this song, it's very kind of laid back, backbeat something. So right there, I, I went from 98 BPM and then I transposed it up and went to 100 BPM. It sounds like it's on a tape machine. I just speed up the tape, which I think is funny. That's an idea for that song, to kind of transpose it and make something more intense and also speed it up a bit and see, see what it feels like. I think it could be a, a, a lot of fun. Okay, next one. <laughs> really like this. I want to create, uh, you know, some different energy levels and some different places musically and maybe some completely different branch of this song. Um, yeah, it inspires me. Okay, next one. I like this. Um, also, coming to a place where you can chill out a bit, and uh, there's going to be plenty of songs that are really upbeat and kind of jolly. Uh, so I think it's important to go to some resting place, like an oasis of something, something like that. So how about this?
it's a version of my song called Lilybird. Uh, and when I make a new version for a, a new hardware, I don't think too hard about the original version. Uh, for me, there really isn't a, such a thing as an original version. I think it's when I create something for this hardware specifically, it's something that lives on this hardware the best way possible for in, in the rules and limitations that this hardware has. So for me, uh, I don't think too much of the the one that I put out on on, uh, on streaming services, for instance, as that being like the original version or the one that I played the first time on the guitar. Uh, no. So yeah, let's see if I can follow up and make it really. Um, like a champagne of energy. <laughs> okay, how about this? Yeah, this is also like a, a really early sketch. I don't know if I'm going to keep it, but I, I like it. Some, sometimes you just need this mood change in, in in the concert like have a place to chill uh, and just go into another kind of zone like yeah i don't know it, it's a very early sketch I, I don't even know what to say about it i guess you can see on the next row here yeah, we've got several patterns lined up. Let's see what it is. This is one of these songs where, you know, at some point in the in the concert, I want to be able to play a song, like a really nice song with a composed melody and a, a build up, and uh, to. So this, I don't want this to be very jam-like. I want it to be more of a, of a carefully written song. So, and this particular song, it's like a melody. This mellow piano sound. Yeah, it started like this. Something like that. This is, um, you know what I did there in the end? Because I have set up this effect box to be an effects send unit, I can send all of the sources to this. And this, uh, in a split second, uh, I, I made like a decision to, to feel like, okay, let's bring it all down. Let's send 
uh, this to this reverb as well to to kind of yeah yeah no I, I think I like it. it it's a good thing to be able to uh, to bring it down to this I don't know to this song rather than a, a jam or a groove and stuff uh, because I that's what I come from I come from from songs rather than um, I don't know elect electronica uh, so yeah yeah hmm okay let's see what's next here I've got something here just check it out it's just a sketch I often put sketches in the end there. okay next bank This is one of the songs where I, I feel like I want to try to uh, be really active on the keyboard here. It's a bit difficult for me. I, I'm not like a, a super skilled jazz pianist or anything. Uh, but with this song, I want to show some of the inspiration that I've got from contemporary pianists and jazz musicians, especially here in Norway. Um, they're not afraid of mixing and matching genres and everything and uh, I'm not afraid of that either but with this song uh, the basic idea here is to, to play really energetic high-paced song on piano and improvise a lot and be very active on the piano. I put out a jam on, on YouTube a few days ago with this material and I got a lot of very nice comments and a lot of good feedback too from, from skilled pianists. And so thank you, thank you for that. I really appreciate that. Good, comment, good comments. And there were some, uh, some nasty comments as well, but I think even the nasty comments were well intended, so thank you for that as well. Well, the thing here is, the plan I've got is to kind of transpose, go from this, to this, to this, and to this. And to do that in a fun and uplifting way. So, uh, and again, I've got like two intensity modes with this. more active on the drums and percussion when I keep the fill in and I'm keeping the piano here I think actually I've got two pianos let's see um, yeah I've got two piano tracks here so one is for the bass one is for additional let's listen to it just the piano so this is the bass and this is the kind of chords. Yeah. And that's coming out of this, whereas everything else is coming out of this. But one thing with the jam that I posted earlier of this song is that I didn't have a clear melody. I didn't have like a framework for the song, something recognizable to come back to or to start out with. And I, w I really want to do that. So with this song, I want to create perhaps like different strong melodies for each transponation. It's like... So the first one is in E flat, I guess. Yeah, I could recycle an old idea on, onto this. Yeah, this would be really nice, actually. Yeah, so we could start by presenting a theme and then uh, freestyling and then kind of transposing, presenting another theme and freestyling, transposing another theme and maybe throw in the original theme uh, once in a while or in the end, I don't know. Uh, something along these lines. And also have the, take the opportunity to bring it all down and perhaps send the rhythms here to 
create this little uh, moment and then go back full on again, something like that. Let's try it. And so forth. Um, obviously, this is something I need to practice, uh, really, really practice. And uh, I, I feel like one of the one of the uh, sensitive issues here is that if I can't hear myself very well, then it, it'll be very difficult to me uh, for me to play because this is not a physical piano. Like with a physical piano, acoustic piano. You can sort of play it anyway, even if you don't hear yourself that well. But with a, this sample, this is electronics, and it's coming through speakers. And um, if you can't hear hear yourself very well, it'd be very difficult. I mean, it'll be difficult with an acoustic piano as well if you don't can't hear yourself. But at least you have your motorized uh, muscle memory to rely on. Whereas here, there is not much <laughs> muscle memory in this. Uh, there's no, not much mechanics in here. Yeah, but anyway, this is a song that I, I, I want to take this moment to kind of uh, overload with some jazzy influences and take it into this world of cuckoo of mine. Cool. Okay, let's, I'm just going to peek over here, see if there's anything. Sketches, sketches. Okay, the next line here, what is it? This is, um, yeah, I don't know. It's actually coming from a song that I made, I haven't released, it's called Friend Song, and this is the first pattern I made. Which is, it has the memory, uh, sorry, it has the melody of the original song. But then I wanted to funk it up a bit and make a new version. Again, there is no original version for me. I just, I want to make it funky, <laughs> that's all. And this is one of the songs where I'm thinking, Maybe I, I could grab the mic and sing. So the melody goes like this. Let's, let's try it in this. Hello. I had a friend and she was sung. I 
had a friend, she used to smile to me. I had a friend, and she was so. I had a friend, she used to smile, and so forth. And now, when I'm operating these electronic stuff, I'm crashing over the gear, and that is not a good. Uh, body figure or body position to uh, to sing, crouching, bending over. You won't get much support from from your uh, belly and from your muscles down there to support your voice. Like when you sing, you want to straighten your body up and perhaps lift your chin a little bit and be more straight to to have a more evenly supported. Uh, muscle configuration in your body so crouching over like this I, I'm gonna tremble my voice is gonna tremble I, I had a friend uh, sorry dun, dun, dun. I had a friend and she was so I had a friend and she was so but when I straighten my whole body figure uh, and make myself ready to sing I had a friend and she was so much more control I had a friend she used to smile to me I had a friend and she was so I had a friend she used to smile and this is one of the uh, songs where I decided to to not use the the analog um, mixer that I had, uh, but rather go with this digital mixer because when you sing, it'd be very nice to have a little compressor on your voice to even out the uh, the amplitude and make it a bit smoother, and also to make a little adjustments on like an EQ on your voice. Another thing with vocals is uh, you really want to hear yourself in the monitor. A lot of electronic music is not performed on big stages, at least not in the beginning, but rather in DJ uh, situations. So if you plan to incorporate vocals there, make sure to have a feedback proof solution for that, because you're probably not going to have good, uh, good monitors that are placed really in a good position for vocals. Chances are that there is a, a huge uh, monitor just turned uh, against you or even it, it might be in the back of you uh, and then to have like a microphone facing the monitor uh, you need to be really careful with that um, because you have feedback um, but there's a lot of good microphones that they are not so sensitive to that stuff and you if you just keep it very close to your mouth uh, you'll be fine okay next this is the last bank This is one of the songs, I'm not really sure if I'm gonna do it, but I feel like this could be a really nice ending song, like a good place where you can say thank you for coming and uh, um, really enjoy it. Like, this, this. Thank you all for joining in tonight. This has been a pleasure performing for you. This is Cuckoo and uh, I'll just be playing this song and then I'll see you uh, out there. Peace out everyone and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. And obviously I haven't prepared, the song is not ready, but it's for me, I'm coming from a more pop oriented background. It's very natural for me to think about engaging with the audience like this, like... Um, you don't want to hunch over the, the gear too much, but at some point, yeah, talk with the audience and uh, say thank you. It's a very good, uh, good practice, I think. Okay, I think I've got a few more sketches and then that's it. So here. This is actually a song that I wrote uh, a few years ago. I never released it. 
uh, as with most of my songs. <laughs> uh, this, it, I might be able to sing that, maybe, if I want to, or I could go instrumental. Um, yeah, so I've got this. moods there and uh, you know from this clear introduction of a melody to that crazy wacky place and then landing on this kind of Japanese um, I don't know fusion funk yeah yeah I kind of like it and during this giving the opportunity to, to play this could be like an extra number even uh, but that would break this lovely ending that I was planning. Yeah, we'll see. So let's see if these are worthy. Uh, listen. Yeah, I don't know. It's a bit early, perhaps. It's also based on a, an old song. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know where to go from here, but there you go. This is what I have so far, and right now, as I told you, I'm right in the middle of the process of, of coming through this. So for me, it's both a, a good time, but also very frustrating, because I can see a deadline where, oh, sh I, I've not got many weeks left now to uh, prepare this, so I need to really select the songs that I want to do, scrap everything else and just do it and and then I'd say that it's enough for th for this particular gig and after this I could improve stuff but I need to set a real deadline for myself to kind of finish it, wrap it up yeah I'm looking forward to this gig uh, by the way it's in Moscow, it's the first time for me to go to Russia which I'm looking forward to immensely um, very, very excited to see Moscow especially, uh, so that would be very cool. And uh, the event is called Symposium, and it's it's going to be something of a uh, both a music festival for, for electronic music, as well as um, different vendors and pr producers of electronic music equipment. I mean, Teenage Engineering is going to be there. They're going to have the OPZ and, and uh, I don't know who else, but a lot of the big players. But what I'm hoping to discover there is to, to see what the Russian vendors are doing. So I'm very eager to see Russian, uh, Russian synthesizers and modules and what, what have you got there. Very curious to see that. Yeah, and I'm also gonna uh, do a little talk of about crowdfunding, and uh, because for me, I've started to use, use Patreon as a crowdfunding platform. It's based on, a, it's sort of a donation platform where you subscribe to someone that you want to support, and you can do that to me on my Patreon site and it, it works really well and um, I think it's a, a real alternative to thinking about the, how to put it, the, the record industry which I think is a bit shaky and also at the ad business which I don't really like and when you realize that one donation is more worth and thousands of ads being played on YouTube, then you knew that you know that there is something wrong with ads, and there is something I think really healthy with supporting people. I support a lot of uh, artists too, and sometimes I don't even have time to check their content, but I want to support them because I find them really important, and, and what they're doing is important. So. I throw in like one or two dollars here and there and if many people do that 
it's, it's, you know, it's outpacing the ad industry in, in a much more healthy fashion, I think. So yeah, if you want to support me on Patreon, uh, find the links here in the video and uh, I'm very, very happy for your donation. So everyone who does that, thank you so much. Okay, I guess this is it. It's as usual. I'm not good with planning, but this is it. This is Cuckoo. Thank you for watching. And yeah, Moscow is coming up really soon. I'm going to make more of these videos. If you, uh, if you think this is interesting to have a little talk about this stuff, uh, subscribe and hit the notification bell down here somewhere. And uh, yeah, be part of this uh, channel and the network. And thank you so much for all the nice comments. And I'll try to answer as many of you as possible. Yeah. I need to... I need to have some tea. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for watching.